Welcome back to JCR Garage, and this time we're doing a Q&A here in the car while I'm on my way back home. Uh, I've gotten in a couple of questions that I figured I would do a Q&A video in answering. Um, the reason there's been a little lack of content on this channel lately is that I've started using my second channel, my old channel, a little bit more. Um, I, used, I first called it uh, DIY Automotive, but I figured that would be almost the same as this channel in uh, content. So I figured I changed the name, I turned it into Automotive Discussion, and on that channel we discuss several uh, phrases and other stuff related to the automotive world. Uh, the first video we posted there was the V6 against V8 conversation. And the next one coming up will be uh, the old adage of um, there is no replacement for displacement. Uh, I'll go further into why that, in my eyes, is no longer true in that video. Now, the questions uh, that I've gotten in, I forgot to take down the names, but I have the questions here. Number one is, what do you do and how old are you? Well, I've gone to school for mechanics, well, being a mechanic on light vehicles, which would be regular passenger cars and stuff in that nature, uh, not big trucks or anything like that. Now, where my expertise in the automotive field compared to what everyone else of my age would be doing is I'm more into the uh, old school stuff, whether like point ignition and all sorts of things you could just fix instead of just replace, because the way a lot of um, mechanics and automotive technicians go nowadays, you plug in a computer, you get the fault and you take that part off and replace it. Uh, the way I like to work rather than that is actually check the parts yourself to see what's faulty and then try to fix it and if you can't fix it then replace it but yeah you don't need to replace everything some things can be fixed now I do know that on some newer cars you can't fix parts you just have to replace them because that's just the way they're built but when I can I go away from that and rather repair the part instead of replacing it which is also why I have a ton of old broken parts in my garage, because I can fix them if I need them. Uh, how old I am? I am currently 22. I'm turning 23 in about a couple of months. Uh, June to be precise. Uh, which would mean that I was born in 1995 and loving old cars as much as I do kind of doesn't go together with that statement of being born in 1995, but, well, you know. So, question number two. What is the most exciting car you've driven? Well, that's a bit of a hard one, because I've driven a lot of different cars. Uh, some not for a long distance, but some really awesome ones have been in that list. Um, I know there's been some really boring stuff like Volvos, 240s, 940s, 740s, crap like that. That is my opinion. Uh, they're so overrated over here that I really can't appreciate them whatsoever. Um, but I would think the most exciting thing personally would have been the time I got to drive a 69 Charger, big block. Uh, it was either a 440 or a 383. That was an exciting moment. And also, 67 Mustang. It wasn't a fastback, but it was just a regular coupe. But that was still quite an awesome thing. Now, go away from the old stuff, I would think the most ridiculous and exciting thing I've driven has to be well, what would that be actually? I rarely think of newer cars as anything in particular. To me, they are just appliances. And 
they are kind of on a different level than what I call cars, sort of. Um, but I would say, yeah, it would have been, uh, it's probably an 80s car. It's, uh, it was a Saab actually, a front wheel drive Saab with a humongous turbo on it. It was a manual car, you put it in second and you floored it and it would screech the tires all the way up until you went into third and it would just keep screaming. That was an insane car. And front wheel drive had that much power, it was... Yeah. It was crazy. Now, you're probably thinking, well that's not a Corvette or anything like that. No, but there are none around. Literally, uh, I know of. I think it's a. What is it? Is it a C6? Yeah, it's a C6 Corvette. I've seen it for years. It is just sitting there because registering it is way too expensive with all the tax. There's horsepower tax and all that stupid stuff. That makes actually a Corvette in this country kind of an exotic because it. You have to have a ton of money to actually get it on the road legally. The same goes for Skylines, like R34s. Yeah, the tax is insane. So that's gonna be basically one of the most exciting things for it was a couple of old muscle cars and a stupid Saab. Um, yeah, next question. That would be, uh, what is the age of which a car gets specific perks for being old? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, the running rule is 30 years old. So 2018, it would be in 1988, would get uh, the perks of an old car. Um, now the perks, sort of in that way, it would be... Um, uh, you don't pay for um, a change of ownership uh, regularly with cars that are a bit newer than 30 years old, like say a 28 year old car or 25 or 20 year old car, you would pay a fee of 1500 um, Norwegian kroner for changing owners on that car, but with a 30 year old or owner, oh, 30 year old or older you don't pay anything and the road tax which is usually around two or three thousand comes down to 450 something for old cars uh, insurance isn't always cheaper it really depends on age and record and stuff like that uh, I know back when I drove my 1988 Plymouth, uh, well, well, no, not 88, it was 1980, Plymouth Volari, uh, 225, Slant 6, 3-speed automatic, you know, regular grocery getter. Uh, then I paid, damn, it's so shaky, uh, 11,000. This road sucks. I paid 11,000 uh, something in a year. It was 1,048 or 49 per month. Of, uh, well, Norwegian Kroner. Um, and on the Aspen, when I got that, now this is just liability insurance. I didn't have anything that covered anything other than damage that I made could cost. Um, on the Aspen, the price actually went down because that car says it's a 225 Slan 6 3-speed automatic car, when in reality it's a 318 that's hopped up about as much as you possibly can hop up a 318. Um, and a 3-speed automatic with a shift kit and full manual valve body. Uh, 
still the same type of insurance. That cost me 900 something. And then I went and registered the Blazer, which on the time I've collected up some bonus, so I get some discount off. But with a Blazer, I paid about 800 and something with glass insurance, uh, theft from inside the car and sort of stuff like that. But that was just because the windscreen was cracked when I got it and I had to, well, place a windscreen. So I needed glass insurance on my car. Um, with this thing, which is the next thing I registered, uh, I pay, I think it's 300 something in insurance. And this is the base insurance you can get. It is same as what I had on the Aspen and the Plymouth. Uh, those were three times as expensive as this thing. And this is just as old as the Aspen. But I've collected up more bonus and they figured they could just turn the price down because I'm hitting 23 this year and 23 is the age where uh, they start trusting you a little bit more when it comes to the insurance because they have when you buy insurance, especially online or when you call them, uh, they ask if there will be a driver of the car younger than 23 years old. And if it is, then the premium goes up. If not, it goes, well, it goes down, it's lower. So that are some of the perks that you get from having an old car. But also, then there's the maintenance cost that usually is high if you say you daily drive an old car. But I would say that the price this has cost me, it really isn't all that bad. I mean, I could have bought, a, say, a 2000 to 2010 model for the price of this thing, but I would have to, well, the price of this thing has cost me, but I would still have to spend yeah, I'm um, probably three times that in repairs afterwards. Because this has cost me anything really. Uh, but that is mostly because I can do a lot of things myself and I have parts available. And that actually leads me perfectly into the next question, which is, what are your recommendations for getting an old junker and fixing it up? Well, if it is the daily, like I do with this, it is get a car that either you know a lot about or someone you know know a lot about them, so you have the expertise on hand. Um, also, if you can get something you know you can find parts for really easily, either you have parts or someone you know have parts, that is a big plus because then you always have uh, at least somewhat of a storage of parts for the car before you start it or start doing the project. I know the reason I bought the Plymouth was because I already had one Aspen and I had scrapped another one so I had a barn full of parts. I knew that if something broke I had the parts to fix it. Or if I crashed it I could, well it wasn't 80 so I could do a front end swap and get a 77 Aspen front end on it. but. Anyway, I had the parts available to fix the car almost no matter what was the fault with it. And with this, uh, I know my uncle had two of them, sedans, but he wrecked both of them. One, he crunched the front end up, so the radiator was on top of the air cleaner. And another one, he bashed the entire side, uh, took out the doors, the fenders, and everything. But I knew that there were solid, well, underpinnings of one, one, at least one. There were enough parts there that I could put mine back together with the parts that we had. Which is what I did, and it didn't end up costing me a lot. Now, I also did end up getting another one that uh, you've seen in a previous video, the green one, that is just a parts car. But that was because I needed a rust-free floor, and, well, that had one. As well as that, it'll work as a, uh, 
Jake to get V8 engine mounts and uh, top loader transmission mount built in. Also, check clearance with headers and exhaust and everything like that. So, one of my my top tip is get something you know a lot about or someone you know knows a lot about. Something you can easily find the expertise to fix. If you if you are a Mopar guy and you find like a almost beaten up Pinto, you don't go with a Pinto. See if you can find something else first, unless someone you know knows a lot about the Pinto. That's something you just do. You go for something you know you can fix or someone you know has the expertise to help you with. That is actually all the questions I have for today. So with that, I say thank you very much for watching, despite my head being obscured by the steering wheel. And I'll see you later.